Okay.
uh, hi, uh, we'll just take a few more minutes. The camera set up. Uh, thank you for being patient. everyone uh, so i'm going to start with uh, motto of inform communicate and empower digital empowerment foundation is not is a not for profit registered under whose effort has been to find sustainable information communication technology solutions including digital and new media to address the digital divide in underserved and underreached regions and communities since our inception in 2002, our broad areas of engagement have also evolved. As an organization established in the early 2000s, much before the expansion of internet infrastructure and digital equipment, our initial focus was on connecting the unconnected regions in India through wireless hotspots and innovative and low-cost internet infrastructure. Over time, we have been focusing on bridging the digital gap in India not just in unconnected areas, but in underconnected regions that are not able to meaningfully use internet and internet services. A recent area of intervention is on the problems emerging out of a significant outlook on the all-encompassing data injustices, which is posing as a challenge towards the holistic empowerment of individuals, groups, and communities in totality. From the inception to the design to its implementation, Data justice requires critical engagement through critical dialogues. We at DEF recognize the need to have this holistic approach to access, agency, and therefore empowerment. And today's report launch, which is based on a comprehensive study conducted by DEF on data justice in India, is a reflection of that. Today we have with us Dorothy Gordon as our esteemed chief guest. She is the chair at UNESCO's Information for All program and is the board member of the UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies in, Educa Technologies in Education and is associated with GPI. Then we have our speakers vis-a-vis -vis authors of the report. We have Ananthu Are, uh, who is a researcher at DEF, and he is going to open the discussion. Then we have Jenny Sulfat, the researcher at DEF. Osama Manzer is the CEO, director, and founder of DEF. Then we have Vinita Venugopal, who is a consultant at DEF, as the reporter of today's discussion. And lastly, I, Tusha Sarkar, a researcher at DEF, am going to moderate today's discussion. Uh, now I would request Dorothy to speak. Thank you. And let me start by saying to everyone, Namaskar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from around the world. It's really a great honor for me to uh, launch extremely interesting. Uh, I believe that all of us are aware of the massive datafication of society that is taking place at the moment. And we know how important knowledge is in terms of achieving the sustainable development. But what we've observed in the past years it is that technological development necessarily that we have reduced vulnerability. In fact, in some cases, actually vulnerability. For this reason that I find F increased attention to this area of data and especially how it affects vulnerable. It's extremely important for all of us to pay attention. We have to pay attention because it is affecting all over the globe. And we can see it even reflected in um, the Global Dig Digital Compact that the Secretary General has come out with as well of, of course, the roadmap. So we see that we have that awareness growing in terms of data for sustainable 
the fact that we cannot take for granted that the new development reduce vulnerability. And at the heart of this, and the heart at the heart of the deaths approach, is the recognition that our policy approach must be grounded in the uni internet universality. That is, it must be rights-based, it must be open, it must be accessible, and nurtured by multi-stakeholder participation. And so, really, this publication is allowing us to take a deep dive into how data is affecting, how it's impacting on some of those principles that all of us have espoused at the level of the UN. Data justice plays an extremely important role towards recognizing what could go wrong and making sure that take the appropriate steps to actually build equitable society. So we must look at how data is being designed and implicated. And let me just mention two quick examples. And there are many such examples in the publication. First of all, you could say that because of the pandemic, there has been a lot of hastily planned implementation of solutions for e-government, for example, as well as in education all around the world. Here, I am not Indian, I'm African, and so I'm speaking from my African experience. But after reading this wonderful book, I can tell you that there are some good examples here as well. So when we do things in a rush, we are not always able to map out all the implications of what could be wrong and who could be affected. And what we see consistently globally is very often people who we already know are vulnerable, such as people living with disability or marginalized groups are further marginalized by the implementation of these. In education, we see that more and more parents are being encouraged to go for solutions by themselves outside the school. And very often they do not realize what is happening to their children's data and the implications. For example, a child may eventually not be able to get into the university they want on the basis of all that data gathered and analyzed and profiled in terms of what kind of student they are. And that also affects us within the school. And it's very interesting to see that in some uh, geographies, we now have child appropriate by design legislation to protect children from being exploited in terms of their data. So one of the words that I hope that we will all become more familiar with after reading the book is algorithmic exclusion. I think it's one of the concepts that is focused on. I want to end by just saying that we can reimagine a better future for ourselves. But that means that we can no longer sit on the sidelines. We have to become far more deeply involved in understanding how technologies are playing out in our society. Um, I think that the release of this report data justice in India should be an inspiration for people around the world to produce similar reports, similar kinds of analyses. And here I throw a challenge out to our academic community all over the globe, get involved and start doing this kind of work. Um, let me just end by saying rights-based, open, multi-stakeholder participation, accessible, we can do this, and I hope that this engagement translates into a more inclusive and citizen-centered data norms in times to come. Uh, I am the chair of UNESCO's program, and we have been looking into kinds of for over 20 years. 
I'm happy to say that India sits of the UNESCO program and is very deeply involved in the shaping of our priorities. I can assure DEF that we will work with them very closely. And let me just say, we'll continue to focus on the transformative power and potential of data equity and justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Uh, now for the report launch, I would kindly request Dorothy and the speaker to kindly hold the uh, report up for a quick and are online, but uh, Jenny, I would kindly request the speakers to turn on their camera. Mama, let's see. <laughs> so can I show like this? <laughs> excellent, excellent. So I hereby declare this excellent report on advancing data justice research and practice, the India report launched and may many benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Uh, okay, so uh, we can start the discussion. So our first speaker is Anantu Are. Uh, Anantu, for you, I have three questions. Uh, one, how have you looked at data justice in your report? Two, how the study was conducted? And three, can you speak a bit about, uh, particularly about uh, your insights that you gained from talking to people who are innovating AI-based systems for social intervention. Uh, okay, Anantu, you have six minutes. You are on. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Um, Teresa has already introduced the work, so I'll just continue from here. Uh, so basically, we had continued the work as like uh, policy pilot partners of uh, Alan, the Alan Turing Institute and the research team at ATI had, over the course of their work, uh, tried to provide a broader frame to the idea of data justice and not limited to the um, most discussed uh, problems of um, uh, privacy and security, which are in itself real problems, but they tried to expand it and attempt to fill the gaps that were there in both uh, research and practice of data justice. So most of our research was guided by their work. Um, so they, and they had identified six pillars of data justice, um, six of them which are not separate and like mutually exclusive of each other, but have uh, have their overlap. So this is um, like a short of time, but the, I will explain in detail in our book and in the website, but to briefly go through it, they are power, equity, access, identity, participation, and knowledge. So power is like understanding and combating the existing deep-rooted patterns of dominance and the structures of power. Equity is seeing the long-term patterns of inequality and uh, attempt to transform it to be closer to reaching social justice. Access is access to data, resources, and innovation. Identity is critiquing the erasure and othering uh, of identities and exposing binaries. Participation is meaningful representation and inclusion of diverse population and views. Knowledge, uh, which is not limited to the dominant version of knowledge, but an epistemically pluralist version that acknowledges the varieties of knowledge. So, uh, ATI has worked with several organizations from the global south to expand this uh, scope and definition and understand issues uh, so that they're not limited to Europe or the parts of the global north. Uh, so we, and for our part, have used these pillars to try and look at the cases, some uh, specific cases that we have identified in India and that either involved data or AI-related tools. So, 
uh, narratives of exclusions and invisibilization that was driven by data. Uh, we talked to communities affected and developers and policy people who sought to implement these. We had conversations with them, mostly over interviews that were conducted digitally because this happened mostly during the third wave of the pandemic, which uh, limited us in meeting with a lot of personal meetings. Uh, but through the interviews, like uh, policymakers mostly tried to defend the choices and explain how their moves were for larger benefits, uh, while developers talked about the issues they faced while they were working on these tools. And we also listened to narratives of discrimination, erasure, and biases that the community faced as these tools were rolled out. Uh, to answer your third question, also very briefly, our conversation with the developers at some interesting mixed results. Uh, to this, let's say briefly, there were uh, several really innovative attempts of using AI for social interventions, like the uh, detection um, system in entrepreneurs would try to detect pests and try to control its spread, uh, which worked efficiently from the statistics. Uh, but however, most developers were from what we talked to other people, they were unaware and not trained in the social impact or uh, how the like how the technologies that they built are related to deep rooted social problems and how they impact uh, how they impact the public and uh, they some of them wanted the public not to interfere in these technical processes. Uh, but, Yes, yes. You, you are audible. Uh, that was mostly it, uh, but like, um, I'll also point to one example of the uh, software on TV. So uh, there was another software, AI for Social Good uh, program that tried to find a TV detection software that analyzed and made the detection in TV faster and better possible. But uh, they later figured out that the problem was not I'll say in India, the problem is not with detection of TV. India had has good uh, programs that detect TV. Like uh, there is no issue there. But uh, the problem is something more deep rooted social, where there, there are no welfare policies that enable people to get nutritional food or resources to help them recover once they have been detected with TV, or like to enable them to continue getting medicines once they have TV. So uh, the Developers, what they needed to do was have a, learn a different uh, social Alangu, lens you to have less than a understand minute. that this was a problem. Uh, that's mostly what I wanted to say. Okay, thank you so much, Anantu. Uh, next, uh, we have Jenny. Uh, for you, Jenny, I have two questions. First, in India, the question of statelessness has become a prominent issue. The centrality that the National Register of Citizens has, especially in the recent past year. In that regard, can you first talk about NRC brief, and then how does data justice become relevant? There? One, two. Uh, <clears throat> India also has a significant population who are home, uh, often migrated. Can you briefly discuss why data justice becomes relevant in their context? Uh, you have six minutes. I will start with it. Uh, uh, data just power and life. The exercise Assam and national. Can to I? One nineteen sixty one, and then one cent thousand. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, order to start. Uh, 
uh, uh, and once in 2008. So to be recognized as a citizen under the National Citizenship Regulation, uh, you have traced your legacy back to the 1951 NRC, National Citizen Registry in Assam, or the voters list from 1961 to 1970. I'll give a brief overview about uh, the historical context of uh, national in Assam. The Bengali uh, or all the Bengali immigrants were brought to Assam from the Bengal by the British at the time of colonial as part of a project to grow because the land in Assam was fertile and they wanted to uh, bring workers to Assam to grow. And uh, the workers who came brought to Assam were mostly Bengali Muslim. And uh, this particular context has uh, a lot of relevance if you are looking at the data collection, which is. Uh, so it also has to be noted that a lot of Bengali Muslims in Assam were also settled in the river island. Uh, which had uh, seasonal floods and they were shifting. First set of exclusion happens, as I said, uh, that your entry into the National System Registry, um, 1951 NRC, was actually not conducted in a lot of parts in uh, And even when it was conducted, uh, the state actually uh, the data about. Um, uh, the NRC. So even when people had documents to prove that they were in the Assam NRC, uh, the government did not. Uh, so the first set of exclusion uh, happens. Secondly, uh, Wipro, uh, a multinational corporation, uh, was deployed to uh, have a software deployed to actually collect and sort. Yeah? and then come up with an algorithm, a family tree algorithm. Now, interestingly, in this family tree algorithm, everybody's, uh, who, everyone who is uh, tracing their legacy from a particular ancestor, for example, if I am tracing my ancestor from my grandfather, my cousins, my nephew, everyone in that entire family, their names need to be matched, their addresses need to be matched, uh, the spelling of their name, and if there is a single error in one of these names, that uh, it scrutinizes everyone's citizen. Now, it is also important to note that people in the islands, the Assam Islands, the River Islands, also have the lowest rate. And most of them had to actually travel back to their village to get the details of uh, the names and addresses are part of the family. It is particularly um, uh, painful for people to uh, go back to their village or from the family, not have any connection to the family, or who had a chosen family, uh, like transfer. Uh, first, it was difficult. A lot of people were excluded. Another layer of exclusion happened at this level. Uh, now, third layer of exclusion happens to the D voters ID, the doubtful ID, uh, which was made by the election tax uh, people were uh, termed as doubtful. Now, even if you have a registration in the NRC that you are part of the D, if you are part of the D, uh, D voters, are not going to not claim. Uh, our respondents also um, reported that uh, the border police, the Assam border police, uh, a, a body constituted specifically uh, also has had a list and the biodata of people who are suspected as foreigners or illegal. And they were also suspected uh, from the. Oh, Jenny, you have a minute. Uh, I'll just get to the huh? now. If the river population in Assam, uh, 
homeless people uh, do not have an address. And then in India, all the welfare are accessed by an Aadhaar ID. Now, mm-hmm. even though Aadhaar is not required to be digitalized, it is required to uh, register death and birth. And citing this, a lot of homeless people are not admitted. Now, Aadhaar also an OT verify uh, all of your welfare services and homeless population for them the phones get so a lot of them do not have a phone so they get the OT and even if they can register the shelter they'll have to keep going back to the shelter to access it I'll also give one example of uh, the uh, uh, case which Anantu discussed for TB patients most of the homeless are TB patients uh, because they don't get the necessary now what happens is that uh, they have an allowance of around ten dollars, five hundred INR. Uh, have nutrition. Now to have this money, they have a bank account. Uh, to have a bank account, you need an address proof or an other account. Now what it shows is that how data injustice. And then if you are going for the automation of welfare and and in governance, actually. I'm sorry, I would have to ask you to wrap. Uh, that. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, uh, next, we have Usama. Usama, uh, okay, so for you, I have two questions. One, in the many years that you have been working on critical digital rights issues in India, how do you see something like Aadhaar fit in the narrative of digital empowerment? And two, how does the discourse of data justice fit in the social intervention programs for digital empowerment? Uh, okay, Osama, you have six minutes. You are on. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that you asked me a much broader question rather than very specific. Uh, 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 I would, I would uh, try to uh, bring in the perspective that, uh, you know, uh, digitization and the process of datafication and the process of uh, digital identity uh, may have given a lot of efficiency to the governance a lot of efficiency to the even welfare distribution. Yeah, I mean, I have heard so many uh, stories on the ground that uh, after UID, uh, many people were able to get their ration much more properly who might have been stolen and things like that. But at the same time, the purpose of digitization and the purpose of, uh, you know, uh, data identification, the idea is not uh, to, to uh, uh, bring in only governance efficiency. The idea is that each and every person should be efficiently served. Uh, what Dorothy earlier uh, uh, you know, uh, mentioned, that it's very important that we do citizen-centric you know, datafication process or data policy and things like that. So even one person left behind or one person not getting their right is not a proper policy of data policy or a digital policy or an identity policy, right? So, the, uh, so India is the perfect example of how we have adopted uh, datafication or data policy or digital policies in such a way that we are we have given more uh, weight to the governance efficiency than the citizen service efficiency, you know. Uh, so, um, uh, and I'm sure there are many examples, they're very harsh examples. Uh, for example, just less than a month back, I heard that there was a news came that there was a pregnant lady with uh, two uh, very small children. She go to, uh, went to the hospital for delivery, and they said that since you don't have Aadhaar or UID, we will not admit you, and she lost her life along with the pregnant, uh, you know, uh, child. So, you know, this very, very, uh, you know, why, why should it happen? The second is also weaponization of uh, datafication or weaponization of digital, uh, you know, policies. 
for example, uh, UID clearly says that if there is no identity available, UID available with a person, you can use any other uh, form of identity or uh, identification. For example, maybe some other ration card or anything, or birth certificate or anything. But no, I mean the bureaucracy and other people start using it as a as a means of exploitation, as a means of subjugation, as a means of exclusion. You know, and that is very very important that uh, uh, you know uh, the policy has to take responsibility of how does it empower the uh, citizen and that is where and, and especially in the current scenario where you are trying to identify each and everything through data each and everything through digital it is extremely important that you also identify that whether your population or citizen have got access to digital identity processes or data identity processes. You know, do we have public access points? Do we have mobile in each hand? Do we have, um, uh, you know, mechanism of people who can help you uh, to, to get those services through digital? We don't. And, and that's the reason why, uh, you know, uh, uh, in most of the uh, digital policies or data policies, it is becoming more and more difficult uh, to serve the people who don't have who have a right but don't have access. And I talked about this yesterday also that it's very important that when we are upgrading ourselves in creating policies which is very very digital driven and data driven, it is very important to keep the citizens' convenience. Uh, you know, at the forefront. I mean, for example, half the population in India is not connected. And, and the same thing will be Bangladesh and Nepal and many other countries, right? The people who are not connected, how do you serve them with digital efficiency? I'm not saying that there is, you know, digital is not required, but how do you serve them in such a way that you have a very strong public access point with digital enablement and digital literacy and digital <laughs> skills so that they can, you know, uh, serve the people at the doorsteps. You know, that's very, very important. And now that the AI is coming, where most of the programs are driven by AI, uh, and the programming by AI, uh, you know, we have another level of challenge that how do we treat people's requirements. So, uh, you know, I would I would say that there are many, many examples. There are five major things that we always think about public welfare, access to health, access to information, access to education, access uh, to food. Uma, you have you a know, minute. Uh, and, and these must be, uh, uh, you know, designed in such a way that the data policy and digital policies actually serve the people with efficiency and without violating uh, their identity and their privacy uh, in a manner that uh, it, it doesn't become risky. Thank you. Thank you so much, Osama. Uh, now we have a very short uh, documentary film based on the interviews taken for this research with the platform workers in Telangana. Uh, I would kindly request Pranita to uh, share her screen and play. Hello, Pranita. To
Pranita? Yeah, Jenny. Uh, can you, are you, can you Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I? Yeah. Can you play the मेरा नाम शेख सलाउद्दीन है मैं तेलंगाना गीग एंड प्लेटफॉर्म वर्कर्स यूनियन का फाउंडर एंड स्टेट प्रेसिडेंट हूँ ग्राउंड पे गाड़ी चलाता हूँ आज की तारीख में अगर जब हम ज्यादा तकलीफ बात करेंगे ओला ओबर के साथ लेके तो चार मुद्दे बहुत अहम मुद्दे हैं जैसे कि एक तीन गाड़ी चार गाड़ी एक ही जगह खड़े होके है जैसे कि एयरपोर्ट जैसा स्ट्रक्चर है इंटरनेशनल एयरपोर्ट वहां पे एटलीस्ट 24 फोर इंटू सेवन पांच हजार गाड़ी बाई फ्लो में दो हजार गाड़ी फ्रीक्वेंसी में खड़े हुए रहते हैं वहां पे मेरे से पीछे आए सो वाले को बुकिंग पहले मिलती मेरे को नहीं मिलती माने ये एक एल्गोरिथम है मैं उसके नजदीक रहने की वजह से मेरे को बुकिंग नहीं देके मेरे से बात आके मेरे से पहले आए सो वालों को मिलता मैं उसके बाद आए तो भी मेरे को बुकिंग नहीं देती ये सबसे बड़ा प्रॉब्लम आज के हालात इंडिया में देख रहे होंगे आप ट्रक्स के ऊपर स्मगलिंग के ऊपर सिक्योरिटी के ऊपर तो ऐसे बहुत सारे मुद्दे आज भी अधूरे हैं ऐसे मुद्दों में आप देख सकते हैं बहुत सारे ड्राइवर्स भी अपनी आईडी डी गुमा चुके हैं क्रिमिनल केसेस बुक कर चुके हैं हालाल में भी आप दिल्ली के इशू में भी देख सकते हैं हैदराबाद के इशूज में भी देख सकते हैं बहुत सारे ड्राइवर्स को जो है क्या बुक करके सिटी के आउटस्कर्ट्स में लेके जाके उनकी जान निकाल दी जा रही है और उनकी गाड़ी खींच दी जा रही है उनसे पैसा भी खींच लिया जा रहा है और वहाँ पे जब हम कस्टमर्स के डिटेल्स पूछेंगे तो वहाँ पे कुछ भी डिटेल्स नहीं होंगे ये सबसे बड़ी दिक्कत है चाहे वो कस्टमर्स के डिटेल्स पूछे तो पुलिस डिपार्टमेंट को देना चाहिए मगर फिर भी वहाँ पे कंपनी नहीं दे रही एक जिम्मेदार कंपनी को जरूर ट्रांसपेरेंसी रखना होगा जैसे कि ड्राइवर की ट्रांसपेरेंसी है तो कस्टमर की भी ट्रांसपेरेंसी होनी चाहिए तो ड्राइवर की ट्रांसपेरेंसी रह रही तो कस्टमर की ट्रांसपेरेंसी नहीं रह रही अगर जब मेरे पास सोचोगे किसी का वैलिड छुट गया या किसी का लैपटॉप छुट गया मेरे कार में वो मेरे पे शिकायत दर्ज करा सकता मेरी आईडी ब्लॉक कर सकता और मेरा टोटली क्रिमिनल केस भी बुक कर सकता अगर जब वही कस्टमर मेरे साथ हादसा करा चाकू से चटपटा मार दिया या कुछ मेरा जान लेवा हमला हमला कर दिया तो मेरी सिक्योरिटी वहां पे कुछ नहीं मैं ही जाके शिकायत दर्ज कराऊंगा तो ना कस्टमर का नाम है ना कस्टमर का फोन नंबर ये आज की दिक्कत है ऐसे बहुत सारे क्रिमिनल केसेस क्राइम केसेस हो रहे और आज तक इसके ऊपर कितने भी शिकायत दर्ज करे तो चाहे पुलिस में भी हमारी सुनवाई नहीं हो रही कंप्लेट से भी नहीं ये सबसे बड़ा वो है मेरा नाम मोहम्मद जमीर उद्दीन है मैं टैक्सी ड्राइवर और ये टैक्सी लाइन में जो हूँ मैं 2013 से हूँ 
देता है करता है यहाँ तक कि गवर्नमेंट तक ले जाए तभी गवर्नमेंट भी इन्वॉल्व है यहाँ तक ऊपर वाले जाने लेकिन यहाँ का सीएम का बेटा पार्टनर है इसलिए कुछ नहीं कर सकते कुछ नहीं बात बात कर सकते क्योंकि उसका लाइसेंस भी रिन्यूअल नहीं है कई सालों से रिन्यूअल नहीं है क्या कर सकते हैं हम लोग हमारे हाथ में भी कुछ भी नहीं है चलाना कहते हैं चलो या मर लो अभी देखिए मेरा बच्चों का देखिए अभी स्कूल फीस देखिए मेरा बच्चों का तीस हजार रुपए है यानी कि महीने को चार हजार रुपए गिरता दो बच्चे आठ हजार रुपए आठ हजार रुपए मेरा ई एम आई है तीस हजार रुपए मेरा आठ हजार रुपए घर का रेंट है अट्ठाईस हजार है दाल की बात कुछ दूर की बात कम से कम मिर्ची डाल के चावल पा सकते ओला देखो या यूबर देखो या सरकारी देखो या कोई भी देखो आपने बता था थ्री परसेंट का अनुभव है लेकिन उन्होंने कहा दाल बैठ तो पांच जगह हम नहीं चला तो बोलते लड़ाई यहाँ पे हमारे को मार दे पुलिस वाले कंपेयर करे तो पुलिस वाले को भी पैसा दे पुलिस वाले को कौन दे के लगा ये ड्राइवर ऐसे चोर को क्या करता है इसको मुंह नहीं है क्या कर रहा है वे क्या रे आंजना चला रहा है तो चला नहीं बाग यहाँ से बोलता किसको जाके बोल रहा है किसका बात सुन क्या कर रहा है यूबर में आने की वजह से हम मर रहे हैं और सिवा कुछ है ही नहीं मौत के सिवा हमारे पास कुछ है ही नहीं ना जी सक रहे ना जी रहे यहाँ तक भी मरेंगे बोलता तो मौत नहीं है वो हाल है ये कार्यक्रम में ऐसा डेवलप कर दिया उनको जैसा मर्जी है कस्टमर को देने के लिए जो उसको एडवेंसरी है वोला जो भी है उनको जैसा मर्जी है वैसा डेवलप करते चले आए तो जितना भी सफर हो रहा है तो सफर को ऐसा उनके ध्यान में नहीं रख रहे ऐसा है कि हम लोग को पहले टू किलोमीटर के अंदर पिकअप देता था अभी जो आठ किलोमीटर तक भी चले जा रहा है वो आप पिकअप के लिए हम लोग को वो आठ किलोमीटर का पिकअप का कुछ हम लोग को पैसा नहीं मिलता जो भी है कैंसिलेशन नहीं है भी तो ट्वेंटी फाइव रुपीज हम लोग को देता तो ट्वेंटी फाइव रुपीज दो किलोमीटर का ही आता अगर टेन रुपीज उसका हिसाब से लगाए तो भी किलोमीटर का पैसा ही मिलता और बाकी का जो छह किलोमीटर है हम लोग का जो से डीजल नुकसान होता तो अभी इतना डीजल रेट बढ़ गया बारे हम लोग ये ऐप बेस्ड कंपनी से रिक्वेस्ट करें कि ऐप में ऐसा डेवलप करो कि हम जस्ट टू किलोमीटर के अंदर कस्टमर को अट्रैक्ट करना जस्ट टू किलोमीटर उसके जो भी आगे जा रहा जो हम लोग को राइड स्टार्ट करे बाद में जो फेयर मिल रहा तो कस्टमर को वो फेयर चार्ज करो आपको कंपनी हम पूछ रहे तो कस्टमर को चार्ज करो जो भी एक्स्ट्रा किलोमीटर जा रहे तो व्हीकल इतना दूर में है तो उसका चार्ज ये लगेगा तो उसमें डेवलप करके हम लोग को ये भी चार्ज देने का कोशिश करो और एक एक ही अभी जो डीजल के हिसाब से हम लोग रेड कार ये मिलना चाहिए कि सेडान व्हीकल है ट्वेंटी फाइव से थर्टी रुपीज ट्वेंटी फाइव से थर्टी रुपीज पर किलोमीटर हम लोग को मिलना चाहिए वो जो भी उनका कमीशन है वो हम लोग को मतलब नहीं है जितना भी ऊपर लेंगे उनका कमीशन ले लो हम लोग को मिलने का रेट ट्वेंटी फाइव टू थर्टी रुपीज सेडन व्हीकल और मिनी व्हीकल ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी फाइव रुपीज ये थर्ड किलोमीटर बेस फेयर फोर किलोमीटर मिनी व्हीकल वन फिफ्टी टू वन एटी रुपीज और सेडन व्हीकल टू हंड्रेड टू टू फिफ्टी रुपीज बेस फेयर हम लोग को मिलना चाहिए ये रेट अगर हम लोग को मिल गए तो हम लोग इस डीजल के हिसाब से ड्राइवर जो भी है ये कंपनी में डिपेंड होकर चला रहे हम लोग को खुशी से संतुष्टि मिले नहीं जब तक कि लोग उनके मर्जी जैसा कस्टमर सर्विस मिलना हम लोग ऐसा ही चला रहे हम लोग का फोन पूरा खींच के पिया कर रहे हैं ये इतना तक ये हम लोग ये आप जो भी कंपनी को डिमांड कर रहे हैं इतने से कमीशन लेकर उनके जो ओला कंपनी और ऊबर कंपनी में एम्प्लॉज है उन लोग को सैलरी बेस करके सैलरी दे रहे हैं और ये पी एफ उन लोग को दे रहे हैं हम लोग को पार्टनर बना के हम लोग से कम से कम पैसे ले रहे हैं हम लोग को कुछ बेनिफिट नहीं है अभी तक तो कुछ भी बेनिफिट नहीं है हम डिमांड कर रहे हैं कि आठ घंटा से दस घंटा तक हमको काम करने का चांस दो और किलोमीटर के हिसाब से ये रेट कार्ड पूरा बनाकर हम लोग को इतना घंटा काम करना ट्वेंटी सिक्स डेज वर्किंग डेज 
आप लोग एक्सपेक्ट करो हम लोग कल टू सिक्स डेज अगर वर्क करते हैं थ्री मंथ तक वर्क कराकर उसके बाद में जो भी थ्री मंथ एक ड्राइवर आपके साथ में तो उनको बनाकर हेल्थ कार्ड और ड्राइवर का कुछ बेनिफिट्स इंश्योरेंस बेनिफिट्स कुछ बनाकर हम लोग को देने की कोशिश करना होगी हम लोग डिमांड एक घंटा जल्दी लॉग इन करो तो टारगेट जल्दी खत्म होता बोल के वो इंटेंशन से लॉग इन कर देते मगर थोड़े रेस्टोरेंट्स क्या करते बोले तो ज्यादा बुकिंग्स ले लेते सिक्सटी टू सेवेंटी बुकिंग्स ले लेते रेस्टोरेंट में काम करने वाले नहीं रहते तीन चार बच्चे से बुकिंग्स आते रहते हैं क्या करता है उसके लेना ले लेते वेटिंग में तीस जने तीस जने रह जाते वेटिंग में बीस जने तीस जने रहता टाइमिंग इंस्ट्रक्शन रहता उधर से कस्टमर बोलता अब टीवी में भी ऑर्डर देते रहे हमें पचास मिनट में ऑर्डर डिलीवरी हो जाएगा इंसेंटिव डिलीवरी हो जाता बोलो तो अच्छा तो सेलिब्रिटी से उन लोग एडवर्टाइजमेंट निकाल के डालते रहते वो गलत है मैडम वो इंटेंशन गलत है हमारा हो पब्लिक उन लोग को नहीं मालूम कंपनी को मालूम कंपनी क्या करता रेस्टोरेंट को सपोर्ट करता बोला तो रेस्टोरेंट बढ़ के रहे तो उसको फायदा है कंपनी को मैं रेस्टोरेंट से क्या प्रॉब्लम हो रहा कंपनी को नहीं मालूम नहीं रहा जैसा रहता मतलब मालूम है अपन को कंप्लेट रेस करे तो भी रेस्टोरेंट को सपोर्ट करता रेस्टोरेंट को सपोर्ट करता या कस्टमर को सपोर्ट करता जो भी बात है उन लोगों का दो भी सपोर्ट से चलता रैकेट चलाने वाले का बॉयस का बात कोई भी नहीं मानता मैंने साहिब चार दिन से अब सिक्सटी ऑर्डर दे लिया अब बंदे अपन लाइन पे जाके खड़े मेरा ऑर्डर दे मेरा ऑर्डर दे मैं पहला माया ऑर्डर दे मेरा ऑर्डर दे तो किसका ऑर्डर बोल के देता चार जन बॉयस का काम करने वाला है बुकिंग्स लेते रहता एक आधे घंटे को एक जन को ऑर्डर देता उधर आधे घंटे में देने में कस्टमर को चिल्लाते रहता कॉल करके इतना देर हो तो मैं क्या खाना ऑर्डर कर तो मैं घर में पता लेके खा तुम्हारे भी तुम्हारा ऑर्डर पैक वो भी पैक तू खा ले तू लेके जा नको मेरे को ऑर्डर बोलते गंदे वर्ड्स यूज करके कम्प्लेट रेज कर देता वो कम्प्लेट रेज करते कि इंस्टेंटली कंपनी एक्शन हमारे ऊपर लेता या रेस्टोरेंट के ऊपर ले लेता कस्टमर का बात नहीं सुनता हमारा बात नहीं सुनता हमारे ऊपर डाल देता पेनाल्टी डाल देता डायमंड सिल्वर प्लेटिनम बोल के रहता दस मिनट डिलीवरी बोल के उससे बहुत जने पेनाल्टी बोल के चलाना पे कर रहे सिग्नल जंपिंग एक्सीडेंट रोड एक्सीडेंट ऐसा बोलते रहे मैडम बोले तो कुछ भी उसके ऊपर कंपनी को देखा जाना फिर भी नहीं रहता मैडम अब कंपनी बोलता है तुम्हारा तुम्हारा सिक्योरिटी तुम फॉलो होके पैसे का बता रहा शोक पैसे का कर रहा पैसे का करने के बाद में रोड पे अब जाना मेरा होना आर्डर आठ आर्डर ही चुका तीन चार बजे तक बारह बजे तक ही अभी आठ आर्डर आठ आर्डर होना मैं क्या करता हूँ मेरा मैं इंटेंशन क्या रहता जल्दी कंप्लीट करना आर्डर फास्टली कंप्लीट करना वो करना ये करना गाड़ी ले लेके जिप बोल के जा जिप बोल के कहाँ तो लग गया हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस नहीं है मैडम मेरी कंपनी में क्लियरली Thank you, Pranita. Uh, okay, so now based on the discussion that we've had, the insights that all the speakers shared with us, as well as Dorothy uh, and the film, uh, I would request all the three discussants uh, to kindly go one by one and speak about the recommendations in how we can use these insights. and employ them in meaningful ways towards the creation of equitable societies and more citizen centric policies on data uh because of shortage of time you you guys have less than 1 minute each jenny a lot of
before we get into have continued actually okay thank you jenny uh, anantu you can go next uh -huh. From the software developers conversation that I was talking about, uh, what, we, what we gathered was the an issue of representation or the participation pillar uh, from the pillars. Um, so there's a problem of demographic composition of the workforce and of the decision makers, which needs to be solved. And this needs to be something mostly done institutionally. So one of the recommendations that we um, developed was for an ethics committee that can ensure the uh, like ensuring the diversity that can help tackle this exclusion. Uh, also, similar to ethics committees, um, there needs to be like the courses on software development, not just AI ML, but generally on uh, tech uh, institute like uh, institutes. They should ideally have include a component of the so tech social sciences, uh, more particularly on data justice. So this. It means a curriculum level change is needed to make the development team aware of uh, socio-political impacts of the coding work that they're doing and how uh, they can uh, change their work so uh, to help challenge existing structures of power and create a more equitable world. Uh, thank you, Anantu. Uh, I would ask Osama to go next. I mean, I will come from purely uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. I would, I would uh, make a suggestion that uh, as an individual, what is my right to data, right to data to, uh, to share, right to data to use, right to data to be known, uh, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so uh, if we are creating a, a situation where everything is becoming digital uh, from access to sharing to efficiency and everything and governance, it is important that as an individual, if my data is being collected, what are my rights? You know, um, from the perspective that uh, my rights not only at the time of collection, but at the time of yours being using the same data again and again and again and again and by anyone. So I would say that's very, very uh, important. And the second most important is that uh, uh, how the data can be defined from the literacy and education perspective so that the whole mass should have a proper data literacy um, at, a, at almost at the level of community. And this is, this is actually we are 20 years late. If we started working on uh, 20 years back on digital format of data, uh, it's, it's, we are already too late. So th this should be incorporated in the policy and into the system. Okay, thank you, Osama. Uh, I would like to thank to all the speakers. Uh, so because we don't have much time, I'll quickly open the floor for any questions that audiences have both online and offline. Okay, so uh, I think we don't have any questions. In that case, I would uh, thank everyone for joining and thank you all the speakers for being here and contributing to this enriching discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.